and he turned on a light and there was a smell of fish oil. Who uses fish oil? Ugh! What kind of lantern is that? How macabre! Oh, the old gallows lamp. Yes, it was, uh, it was my great great grandfather's. And now I see it. Well, I believe the technical term for the architecture is early to mid maniac. <laughs> but it, it's worse than that. It's biological. The vaulted ceilings, they're not like a cathedral. They're like a dog's jaw. How, how can you live here? Oh, I'm used to it all, though. I grew up here, as did my father. Did. And are you sure it's safe? I mean, there was a crack going into the house. I would have that checked if I was you. Oh, dear me, that's been there all my lifetime, and probably my father's and my grandfather's. It's just my and subsidence. I never think. And I could see he wanted to change the topic. He showed me one of his pictures. Did you paint them? I did. And it was a fine art. Is it the house? It is as I dreamt it one night. It looks like it's walking. And it made me even more full of trepidation. And I thought to myself, I'll go in the morning. So I thought it was too late to leave now. So I went up the stairs. But before I did, I thought, I'm going to check that crack. And I opened the front door a peek, and I looked outside. And there was the crack. And if anything, it was wider than I remembered. And the shadow was blowing. But I knew I could do nothing then. So I went upstairs. Now, as I said, I meant to leave early, but the ways of the house had already entered my spirit, I think. I slept long. I woke up way past noon. I came down to one of those random meals you sometimes have. Brunch, tea lunch, I don't know. <laughs> and there she was. I had never met her before. Madeline. Surprisingly, quite a look. And more than that, she was charm itself. She asked me that wonderful question that only a girl will ask. Oh, how fascinating. Tell me all about the bank. <laughs> and I told her all about the bank and my position in it. And about my car. And she seemed so interested. I said, you will have to come out with a ride with me one time, my dear. Oh, I would dearly love to, but I have not been well, as probably, probably told you, and I fear I cannot go out. Meaning to change the subject, I said, well, maybe after supper, maybe after supper, I could read to you. I would like that a great deal. But just at that moment, we had talked so long, Roderick came in again, and he said, Oh, it's time for dinner. And he led me to the dinner hall. Now, do you know, it was strange. There was a fine dinner there, on great plates. But I had seen no servants. None at all. Nor could I imagine any would stay in that house. Well, after dinner, I said, I, I better, I'll go to the car, and I'll go get my book, and I will read to you. And I went out and down the steps just as the light was failing. And there was the crack that I had forgotten during daylight. And it was wider yet. And the shadow was deeper. But thinking I will be, I will be as they are, I stepped gingerly over it. And I got my book from the car. And I went in smiling to myself. But there was Roderick waiting for me in the shadow by the door. And he came up to me and said, Listen, old chap, if you would not excite Madeleine too much, uh, I would very much appreciate it. She has not been With well. some foolish story, a jealous brother, I'm sure you agree. So I got out my book. Now I am rewriting the stories of Arthur, the Immortals of the King, writ large. And key of those is, of course, 
the great tragedy of Lancelot. And I was reading the love, the story, and Madeleine was listening, all, all eyes, as I got to the moment of Lancelot's heartbreak, as he must choose between his love and his king. And suddenly, Madeleine got up and fell over. <sighs> and I read to her, and she was cold. I cannot get her heart beat. I cannot find her heart. But Roderick, he stood up and he said, oh, My sister has always suffered from catalepsy. This may be one of her fits. But, but she's not breathing, Roderick. Well, we must take her upstairs to her room and lay her out. And we took her upstairs and we laid her upon her bed. Roderick, we can't just leave her. I must go and get a doctor from the nearest town. And I ran down the stairs and I ran and opened the door. And it was as if night came to greet me. And I could not face the shadow. And I closed it. Roderick. Roderick, yes, I will not go out. I will not get far. No, it, it is better that you should wait. It is this house. It is evil, I tell you. It is a lie. I have sometimes felt that it was brought to me by it somewhere, but I try to pay it in the mind. This is all I've ever known. And it is so strange. There is no servants here, is there? The food just appears as if it was an Arabian night. It has always been this way. Who built this house? And why? Was it the mist of time? My father never said, not, nor did my grandfather. Meaning to change the subject, no doubt. He what? suggested. Why don't you read me one of your tales to pass the time until morning? I do not feel I can sleep with that way for it. And so it was. I turned to my darkest tale. The great tale of the hunting of the world <laughs> of Horus. That tale of how he rode through the forest, long, searching out the worm, and I could not find it. And in that tale, he goes into a chapel just at the hour of prayer. And he sits in the chapel, having left his sword and his shield and his helmet outside, not to go in the warrior. And he prayed and sat in blessed meditation. But as he opened his eyes from the prayer, he suddenly saw, coming towards him, guided by some second sight, the altar had turned into a tunnel. And it flashed towards him as the chapel fell down on him, meaning to crush him. But just as I was getting to the fight, suddenly, from upstairs, <coughs> there was a scream. Madeline! Madeline! And we ran up the stairs and into her room. <coughs> but it was empty. Gone. It was as if, from the mark on the bed, it had taken her. Roderick! You must leave. And I grabbed him by the shoulder. We're going! And I pulled him down the stairs. But when I was down, suddenly he broke free and said, Montague, you must go. You must go while you can. And I tugged him. But it was as if the house already had him. And he pushed me away. And I fell through the front door. Just as the crack I spent the night in the car, and when I woke, the lake had swallowed the house of Usher and all those within. And I drove home. Now, when my brother told me this story, I, I didn't necessarily believe it, but I checked out the details. There once was a house there, and now there is a lake.
we drove off. And then halfway, halfway there, he stopped the car. And he pulled up on the side of the road, and he turned to me, and he said, in a voice like I was another human being, you know, I'd never heard him use that tone to me before. And he looked me in the eye. Well, I was scared, because this had never happened before. And he looked at me, and he said, Dan, are you sure you want to go to the today? You don't have Don't you call me. 